Welcome to session eight of the End Times Bible Conference hosted by Nullamara Church of Christ right here in Nullamara, Western Australia. Our Bible teacher and servant to our hearts has been Colin Latoury. Colin serves with Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry here in Australia, and we have been so blessed by the preaching and teaching ministry he has shared with us all week. This is the eighth and final session called the Millennial Reign of Christ. Get ready to be blessed and praise God. Jesus taught his disciples to pray these words. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, while there's a sense in which the kingdom of God is within those who believe in Christ right now, the kingdom we pray about in this prayer, in the Lord's Prayer, is the kingdom to come upon the earth following the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when the kingdom has come, as Habakkuk wrote, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now this kingdom will have two distinct phases. The first phase will last for a thousand years, hence it's referred to as the millennial kingdom. And the second phase of the kingdom of God will be the eternal or blessed state which follows. Now when Christ comes again as our king following the tribulation, absolutely amazing things are going to happen on planet earth. From Daniel chapter 12, verses 11 and 12, we can deduce that there'll be an interval of some 75 days between the Lord's return and the establishment of the millennial kingdom. We understand this period to be a time of preparation for the functioning of the kingdom. So what will happen in this time of preparation? Well, the first thing is the nations will be judged as to their worthiness to enter into the kingdom. And the first part of this, we talk about the Jews from the nations. Ezekiel 20, verses 34 and 35 says this, I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you were scattered, with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and there I will plead my case with you face to face. So the Lord is going to gather those Jews who to that time have been living in the various nations all over the world, and he's going to bring them to a place of judgment. Verses 37 and 38 say, I will make you pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will purge the rebels from among you and those who transgress against me. I will bring them out of the country where they dwell, but they shall not enter the kingdom of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. In verse 40, For on my holy mountain, on the mountain heights of Israel, says the Lord God, there all the house of Israel, all of them in the land, shall serve me. There I will accept them. So the Lord will test the worthiness of those Jews to enter into his kingdom and receive the blessings of the new covenant. And concerning those not deemed to be worthy, God says, I will purge the rebels from among you and those who transgress against me. Now taken in its proper context, the parable of the virgins, this is in Matthew 25, 1 to 13, is actually about this same separation of Jews at the time of Christ's return. Some will be ready and waiting. These are the five wise virgins with oil in their lamps. And others, the five foolish ones with no oil in their lamps, will miss out. To the foolish ones, the Lord will say, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. But those who do come through this time of testing and are accepted because of their faith in Messiah will enter the millennial kingdom still in their mortal bodies and they will live normal kingdom lives, working and having children. And according to Isaiah 65 and verse 20, they will live to a good age and eventually they will die. Now there's a second group to be judged. This is the Gentile nations, and these groups are referred to as the sheep and the goats. Matthew 25 from verse 31 says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, 
and the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The fate of the other group, the goats, who are judged unworthy to enter the kingdom, is seen in verse 41. Then he will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now it's very interesting to have a look at how this judgment will be made. What will be the standard for acceptance or rejection of Gentile people at that point in time? Well, it will be according to how they treated the Jews, Christ's brethren. The sheep are those who during the tribulation period have come to the aid of the Jews, especially those who witnessed for Christ. Matthew 25 and verse 35 says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in, and so on. So in the wicked environment of the tribulation, the fact that they helped the Jews at the risk of severe retribution demonstrates their faith in God and thus they are deemed worthy to enter into the kingdom. And Jesus makes the acknowledgement of their sacrifice at that time very personal when he says this in verse 40. Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So these saved Gentiles, those who looked after the Jews, particularly in the time of the tribulation, are invited into the kingdom by the king himself. And with that in mind, we now see that following the time of judgment of both Jews and Gentiles, it's only believers in Messiah who enter the millennial kingdom. And they will carry on their lives as well, just as at any time in history, except for the presence of righteousness in place of sin. They will marry, they will have families, they will hold jobs, they will die as generation follows generation through the extended 1,000 year period upon the earth. What's the second thing that we can learn here? The second amazing thing that happens. Well, the millennial kingdom itself will be set up. Many different passages speak of this millennial kingdom and Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 to 4, give us something of a summary. And this is what it says. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. And listen to this, friends. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Of course, a significant blessing in this new kingdom also is the fact that Satan will no longer be able to promote sin in the world, for he will be, according to Revelation 20 and verse 2, bound for a thousand years. And now as the kingdom period commences, a whole series of prophecies with which we are very familiar will finally come to pass. This is exciting. 
First, there is the promise Jesus made at the Lord's Supper. Matthew 26, 29. I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And now that time will have come. Daniel 7 and verse 14 foretells his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. And those verses from Isaiah with which we are so familiar, especially at Christmas time, will find their fulfillment. Isaiah 9, 7. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, I just love that. When you see it in its context, uh, heralded with the beginning of Jesus upon the earth, with his birth and now finding fulfillment in the millennial kingdom. And Jerusalem will be the centre of worship for all the nations. Zechariah 14 and verse 16 says, And it shall come to pass that everyone is left of all the nations which came up against Jerusalem shall come up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So all the world will be rejoicing and worshipping. The glory of Messiah now will come to the temple. Ezekiel 10 tells us that the glory of the Lord departed from the temple in his time, about 595 BC, because of the sins of the children of Israel. Later he foretold that the glory of God would return, passing through the east gate and coming to the temple. This is what he foretold in Ezekiel 43 from verse 4. And the glory of the Lord came into the temple by way of the gate which faces towards the east. The glory of the Lord filled the temple. Then I heard him speaking to me from the temple and he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. This is of particular interest to us because the East Gate or the Golden Gate as it's called has actually been sealed shut for centuries. Ezekiel also spoke about the sealing of this gate in Ezekiel 44 and verse 2. And the Lord said to me, this gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened and no man shall enter by it because the Lord God of Israel has entered by it. Therefore, it shall be shut. Many commentators suggest the entry of the Lord God of Israel refers to the triumphal entry of Christ on Palm Sunday. While the Gospels don't specifically mention the East Gate, we do know that it's located directly across the Kidron Valley from the Mount of Olives. And so the east gate that existed in Jesus' time was probably the gate through which Jesus gained access to the city after visiting his friends in Bethany on the southeast side of the Mount of Olives. A wonderful little website titled The Mount of Olives gives us some information to fill in the idea of how it got to be sealed. It says, in the mid-1500s, after the Ottoman conquest of Israel, the existing walls around the old city were erected by Sultan Suleiman, or Suleiman the Magnificent, as he was called. At that time, the Sheikh ordered a Muslim cemetery placed directly in front of the East Gate, postulating that the high priest could not enter through the East Gate, given that a high priest was not permitted to touch the dead. Now this East Gate has held special interest with Jews, Christians and Muslims as the place of final judgment. Jews identify Messiah's arrival 
with the east gate. Muslim, Muslims place God's final judgment by the east gate. And Christians link Christ's entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and the second coming with this same gate. So this is a very significant place. One of the most special memories I have uh, from the first time I went to Israel was standing on the Mount of Olives and, and this view, this photograph is taken from a lower section of the Mount of Olives so it is looking from this perspective. Uh, we were looking over the Kidron Valley and the Temple Mount and the East Gate and we were thinking about the history of this city and what is yet to happen in this very place in a coming time and as we stood there we raised our hands towards Jerusalem and we prayed and then we sang, Baruch Hava B'Shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I can tell you uh, that was a wonderful thing to do in anticipation of the time when the Lord is going to come and enter through the East Gate. Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48 suggest that a new temple is going to be built here. And it also suggests that animal sacrifices will recommence. Now many ask the question, why would that be? And I have to say, we don't know exactly what the answer is. It's just that Ezekiel's uh, prophecy tells us about that. Some say perhaps it will be as a memorial to what Christ has already done. Some say perhaps it'll be to cleanse the temple. We don't know exactly but it does mention this in the new temple in Ezekiel 40 through 48. What we do know is that Messiah will rule over the whole earth with his saints. There will be a great multitude of glorified saints, including you and me, who will have returned to earth with Christ. And this will also include the tribulation saints, and of the tribulation saints, it says, these are the ones who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God and who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with, with Christ for a thousand years. And those who gave up everything to follow Jesus as his first disciples, they'll receive the promise the Lord made to them. This is Matthew 19 and 28. Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now also, according to Daniel chapter 12 in verse 2 and verse 13, with the return of Christ, the faithful saints of the Old Testament will also arise to their inheritance. So we've got all of these redeemed people, those from the Old Testament, those of us who've been followers of Messiah. And what shall we all do? Well, as we continue in Matthew 25 with the parable of the talents, and you've got to remember Matthew 25 follows on from Matthew 24, You've got the second coming in 24 and in 25 you've got the establishment of the millennial kingdom. And taken in context, Matthew 25, the parable of the talents applies to the kingdom. And in the kingdom we shall receive responsibilities in keeping with our faithfulness here in this life with the gifts God gave us to use. It should be the deepest desire of every one of us right now, today, before these things actually happen. Our deepest desire that in that coming day, we will hear the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter the joy of your Lord. My friends, these things come to pass in the millennial kingdom. Now, with only those who are saved on earth, uh, along with the redeemed of all the ages, 
it's likely that this is also when the marriage supper of the Lamb, which had been foreseen in Revelation 19 and verse 9, will take place. The next thing that's amazing is that there's going to be a remarkable life-giving river which will flow from under the threshold of the temple. I love the detail that God gives us on these things. Zechariah 14, 8 and 9 tells us that living waters shall flow from Jerusalem. Ezekiel saw this same stream flowing from under the threshold of the temple and flowing towards the east. Do you know what's towards the east of Jerusalem? We're getting down into the Jordan River and we're getting to the Dead Sea. So in the prophecy, it began at the, the place of Messiah's throne. It began as a spring. Then as it flowed, it came up to his ankles and then to his knees and then up to his waist and it became a great river that could not be crossed. In verse 8, he tells us that this water will flow from the east and now down into the Dead Sea. This is how it words it. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the rivers go, shall live. There will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there, for they will be healed and everything will live wherever the, rivers, the river goes. Have you ever been to the Dead Sea? I, I love to go in the Dead Sea. It's, it's so salty. It's, you can float on it. It's almost impossible to sink. And it's so salty, you've got to make sure you don't get it in your eye or in your mouth because it really burns. But in terms of fish and life right now, the Dead Sea is dead. It has a salinity of about 34%. Or if you like, ten times that of the oceans. Psalm 46 and verse 4 speaks of this same river and it says this. It's a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. And then the psalmist reminds us of the blessings and the majesty of this great God in verses 9 and 10. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. What a difference it makes even to nature when the king has come. And that brings us to the, the next amazing thing. Israel's millennial promises are going to be fulfilled. Establishment of the borders of Israel. You see, Genesis 15 and verse 18 tells us the borders will be from the, the river of Egypt in the south right up to the mighty Euphrates in the north. These boundaries have never been achieved in all Israel's history to this point in time. But in the millennial kingdom, they will be because God never fails in his promises. What's more, Israel still has a special place with God. They have what we refer to in our own language as favoured nation status. Zechariah 8 22 and 23 says this Many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days ten men from every language of the nations shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So these are going to be marvelous things. At the same time, all over the earth, all over the earth, there will be things not witnessed before among people in any of our history. It will be a different world to live in. 
all of the good and the righteous and godly things we might ever have desired for our lives will be evident in abundance. There's going to be holiness. There will be peace. And there will be things in the environment. There will be justice. And there will be longevity of life. There's also going to be harmony in nature. Things will be so beautiful in our environment. Everything will just come together. And when we see these things, we will know that we are in a, the new kingdom. But there's going to be harmony in nature. Wild animals will no longer be wild. Can you imagine that? Have you ever thought that you'd like to go to one of those big creatures that, that's wild now, but you'd love to cuddle it? Well, if you think it's not possible, I want to show you a DV clip from something that actually is happening now and use this just to give you a foretaste of what it might be like in the time that is to come. Isaiah 11, 6 to 9 says... The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hold and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Wow! They shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. As you stand beside the great oceans and you see all of that water, that's how it shall be at that time with the holiness of the Lord and in his presence and the kingdom in which we will be. And this incredible phase of the kingdom will last for a thousand years. It tells us that six times, one thousand years. Revelation 20, verses 2 to 7. Now this kingdom is also referred to as an everlasting kingdom for God is forever on the throne and there's no other earthly kingdom ever to follow. So how do we move from the thousand year kingdom into the everlasting? Well, as the thousand years concludes, Satan is going to be released from the abyss for a short time. He will go out to deceive the nations and will gather a large group of unsaved people because, of course, people have to be converted because they're being born upon the earth. These will be some of the unsaved ones now and bring them against Jerusalem. And this rebellion shows that man's basic problem in all ages and even in the very best of environments, man's problem is his sinful, unregenerate heart. Let me quote from Paul Benware in his book, Understanding Bible Prophecy. He says, These rebels have lived in Messiah's kingdom, a near-perfect environment. They cannot claim poverty, a lack of knowledge, bad circumstances, or an unfair judicial system as reasons for their rebellious behaviour. Their problem is their sinful heart. This event underscores the truth that when given the opportunity to rebel against the Lord God, sinful man will do it every time. This rebellion will be put down absolutely by God. And the scripture says, fire comes out from heaven and devours them. The devil himself will then also be cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet already are. And the scripture says in Revelation 20 and 10, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. As for the other things that take place at this time, Revelation 20 verses 12 to 15 tell us of the final judgment of the unsaved dead. 
John writes, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. All, all that is sinful, all that is rebellious has now been removed forever and it's now replaced. And John says in Revelation 21, 1 to 5, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write for these words, are true and faithful. The Apostle Paul tells us what happens as we approach the eternal state in 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 26. Paul writes, Then comes the end when he, that is Christ, delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts a rule to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he's put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Paul is talking here of the transition from the millennial phase of the kingdom into the eternal phase with new heavens and a new earth. And perhaps we can talk about that one day, but that's a message for yet another day. So what does this all mean to us now as we wrap up this message and this series? The general message is simple. God's authority will be recognised in all the earth. He is the only true God. There is no other. Secondly, God's promises will all be fulfilled because he's faithful right to the last detail. Evil will not triumph because God alone is sovereign over everything. And the intermediate kingdom leads us into eternity because this is an everlasting kingdom. Is there a personal message from this? Ah, yes. The personal message is very simple. Keep faith in God. Keep serving. Keep loving. Keep going, keep sharing, keep watching, because the best is yet to come. May God bless you, my dear friends, and may God just remind you of the importance. It's in this life that we have the opportunity to receive Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. If you leave it and you end up finding yourself in the tribulation, yes, there is still the chance of being saved, but what a terrible time that is going to be in the tribulation period and look at the blessing of what God has in store for those who've placed their faith in him. Let's pray as we close. Heavenly Father, we bow ourselves before you because we know we stand in the presence of a holy God. We thank you, Lord, that you have revealed yourself with such amazing detail that you tell us these things that we might know ahead of time, that you know all things before they even happen. You know the end from the beginning. 
And Father, we thank you that you've chosen to reveal them to us because that helps us to know, Lord, we can trust your word. Your word is precious. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts right to the division of bone and marrow. In other words, it gets right down into what matters in our life, in our circumstance, in our behaviour, in our attitudes, in who we are. May we live before you, dear God, in a way that is worthy as best we can, worthy of the great salvation and grace that you've brought to us in Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We bless you, we thank you, we worship you. And we ask a blessing for all who hear this message and we say, even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Well, we have had a wonderful experience journeying through the Bible this week with our guest Bible teacher, Colin Latoury. Our series on the end times has been encouraging, eye-opening, and certainly raised even more questions about the signs of the times and how we can respond faithfully and courageously through the power of the Holy Spirit to make an impact as a daily witness for Jesus in our own sphere of influence. Well, we welcome you to stay connected with us and let us live this journey out together. If you live in the Perth area and are not a part of a worshiping community where they're seeking Christ Jesus to have supremacy over all things, we invite you to consider coming and joining us on a Sunday morning or maybe you want to join us at a prayer meeting or one of our other ministry groups. We can also uh, participate together in a four-month study of the book of Hebrews. It's going to be very exciting. And we'd like you to be a part of that. We want to serve and bless you and we want to remind you that Colin has provided booklets for each one of these sermons, and we have those available here at Nolamar Church of Christ. We're also grateful to be able to partner with Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry, Colin Latoury and Kevin Vargas. They've been a wonderful blessing to us and great servants, and we encourage you to seek them out through the Friends of Israel website. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy, and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you and we hope to see you here at Nellamara Church of Christ. Amen.
stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it.